<clears throat> Looking out over the audience, I uh, just wonder who it is that has need of the nursery. <laughs> There may be some, I don't know. <laughs> Nevertheless, I uh, certainly regret the occasion again uh, because, uh, you know, David is suffering from physical ailments, and I pray that those things are, you got to find out what it is first, and I hope they find out what it is and they can treat it appropriately. If you recall, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I made a presentation on slavery. Of course, gave a lot of historical information there and then uh, talked more about that from a biblical perspective. And I was talking to David about that, and he said, you know, it'd be a good follow-up to that to talk about, if you talk about slavery, you know, we're slaves of Christ, we're slaves of righteousness. You, can, you, you can't be one or the other. If you're slaves of unrighteousness, then you're not slaves of righteousness, and uh, so forth and so on. So, I, you know, I thought, he said, why don't you talk about the liberty we have in Christ? You know, how can you be a slave of Christ and at the same time uh, have liberty or freedom in Christ? And I thought that was a good idea. <clears throat> when I got into it, I said, well, you know, there's got to be a, some preparatory, uh, preparatory information provided in order to lead into that. So I'm not going to talk about that specifically tonight. If you want to kind of get a, a heads up on that, you might want to read the uh, sixth chapter of Romans and the fifth chapter of Galatians, because I will be dealing with that uh, at a later date, unless David recovers, <laughs> then I'll still do it at a later date. But I want to talk about uh, rights, liberty, and uh, freedom, uh, just a preparatory to lead into that, which, which will be done later. If you're familiar at all with the Declaration of Independence and the uh, uh, Constitution of the United States, there are certain parts of it, and I want to read certain parts. second paragraph of the uh, Declaration of Independence, it reads in part, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the preamble to the uh, Constitution of the United States uh, reads, in part again, We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And in order to do that, we do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Now, I'd like to focus on the concept enumerated in these two readings of life, liberty, or liberty in particular. Now, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are specifically enumerated rights. But that's not all the rights. He just said these are three of the rights that uh, we are endowed by our Creator. Liberty was uh, conceived as the Founding Fathers as a right. Furthermore, the Constitution declares that liberty has certain blessings that must be secured. So that one has to be proactive in the securing of these uh, blessings, even though it's a right. By implication, there is a, a right to secure these blessings. But it does not necessarily follow that the individual has the ability or the skills to secure these blessings. Now, liberty means the condition in which a, an individual has the ability to act following his or her own will but not only the ability, 
but also the legal right to do so. A legal right would mean that there is a legal immunity when rights are pursued. There is much talk about rights today. Uh, Gary, you have that uh, video, that whatever it is. Now, I happen to find this on the internet, and I hope it's as clear to you as it is to me here. Science is real. You, you may, I, I wouldn't consider this as a <laughs> Christmas present for anybody. But Black Lives Matter, no human is illegal, love is love, women's rights and human rights, kindness is everything. Now, what does all that mean? <laughs> I'm not sure what all of it means, but I want to focus on women's rights and human, right, human rights. Well, what are they? What is that? I'm not really sure uh, what all that is. But liberty means the condition in which an individual has the ability to act on his or her own, her own will, but not the ability, but the legal right to do so. And that legal right implies a legal immunity when those rights are pursued. You don't be thrown in jail because you're pursuing a right. There's much talk, as you see from this uh, picture, there's much talk uh, about uh, rights, um, whether it's human rights, women's rights, gay rights, uh, uh, puppy dog rights, or what, what, there's all sorts of rights. Uh, there is uh, very much discussion of human rights without bias. It, it's, all, it is almost invariably uh, uh, pitting one group, uh, their interest against another, or the society's interest at large. There's much talk about uh, human rights as seen from the Declaration of the uh, in independence and the U.S. Constitution, the preambles, and indeed throughout history you find this, this discussion about rights. It appears recently to be uh, much confusion about what liberty or rights means, as you see from this. Anybody can explain this to me. Uh, I'm willing to listen. But that was not so throughout much of our history as a nation. State constitutions of the 18th century give ample evidence of the overwhelmingly Christian view that rights are endowed by the creator of the universe with a manifest connection between Christianity, moral virtue, and national liberty. There is much talk today about uh, human, human rights and women's rights and so on, but there's little talk about duties and responsibilities. Quite frankly, I find that rights are confusing without specifying the duties associated with those rights. A right, as uh, stated, is a legal immunity primarily from the state imposing its will on the individual or the population at large. God had a legal right to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man did not. Consequently, God could specify the terms for access to it or deny access altogether. No one could usurp his rightful claim to this tree. No one had a rightful claim to another's property. There, Adam and Eve had no legal right to partake of this fruit. It wasn't their tree. A duty or responsibility to do something implies an immunity from co coercive interference. When Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark, Mark 16 and 15, the Christian is immune, or should be immune, from the jurisdiction of the state if the state makes laws prohibiting the Christian from fulfilling his duties, Acts 5.29. There is a 
moral and intellectual relativism today that causes confusion over human rights and judicial pronouncements. It's easier to write this stuff is it, than it is to say it. <laughs> so, if it is assumed that no real absolute law exists, then it follows that an individual's rights must be relative. The reason that there is so much debate about what is right, that is, what is ethical or moral, is that there is no consistent consensus about what is right. Many maintain that to define what is right is to speak in absolute terms, which does not fit the evolving nature of morality based on an evolutionary worldview. And to speak of absolute rights <clears throat> is to speak of an absolute source of such rights. As long as moral relativism prevails, human rights will always be elusive. There is no common ground to discuss liberty as a right without a biblical definition of liberty. No one in a communist state can, can uh, say that a human right is being violated when the system is unhinged from any moral absolutes. Without an unchangeable law, there can be nothing to criticize. When a nation moves away from the absolutes of God's law, a human contrived substitute will fill the void. The human rights idea has become the, become the alternative to biblical principles. All too often today, it forms the basis for all areas of human conduct. Man becomes the denominator and the determiner of what comprises human rights. The modern doctrine of human rights answers to no one but man. Lawmaking power there is uh, therefore assigned to man as man. Man cannot be held responsible to anyone greater than himself. Responsibility is denied because there is no one to whom responsibility must be shown. Where there is no responsibility, there is no accountability. The prevailing law, quote unquote, is that every man does what is right in his own eyes, Judges 17, verse 6. Instead of working for justice, as, as defined uh, in God's law, the disgruntled demand individual or class rights based on their own distorted view of justice. The most powerful, those who speak the loudest and carry the most political clout, are the ones who gain the greatest number of rights, usually for themselves and at the expense of others. Human rights become a declaration of self-law. Responsibility and accountability are abandoned for self-declaration. If one is doing what is right in his own eyes, then there are as many laws as there are individuals, or at least as many as have the power. Since every individual is a law unto himself, each, or, or the group they represent, each will demand rights for himself or themselves. Responsibility to the one true God is denied, and a struggle among the many contradictory claimants of rights ensues. Man, however, must answer to someone in order to make the human rights doctrine work. The state must enforce the prevailing system of human rights as conceived by the majority, or a revolution will usher in a new system of rights. And I think we ought to consider that carefully. Without the particulars of God's law, the rights of some can be taken away to secure the rights of others. A careful study of scripture, scripture does not support the idea that human rights as conceived and 
promulgated by humanists today, uh, that's just not an idea, it's just not uh, supported by the Bible. God's warning to Adam was that if he disobeyed the clear command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would die. Galatians, second chapter, verse 16 and 17. Paul said that life, breath, and all things are gifts from God, Acts 17 and 25. We cannot, therefore, claim them as rights. If life is a gift from God, then to take away life at its very inception is an act of rebellion against God. Romans, the first chapter, 28 through 32. The modern doctrine of human rights, because it is not rooted in God's character and law, can designate some lives unworthy of existence. And we see that throughout history. Laws can then be passed to dispose of the lives of those undesirable or unwanted. Because God is the giver of life, it is not the duty of those in power to grant rights to anyone but to protect the lives that God has called into existence. Rights will not do this unless coupled with responsibility and accountability to an absolute and divine standard. Christians are not to work for human rights, quote-unquote, whatever that is, but are to be responsible to an all-holy God and to follow his law. No one can understand the nature of rights until one is confronted with his own sin. The provision that God has made to make man free from sin and the responsibility that everyone has to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 12. Justice must be defined in terms of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. After all, Jesus went to the cross because justice demanded that the sinner be condemned. If one wants to be right, he must be made right in the manner prescribed by the gospel. The course of this nation, or any nation for that matter, depends on the people submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Redeemer. There will be no blessings, that is, rights, for the people because or people of this nation or any other nation if the sole concern is for human rights, in quotes again, rather than the saving message of the gospel, God's power to save. We hear today about the right to choose, the right to life, and right to health care, the right to a living wage, and the right to die, and, and so on. You can name any sort of right that you you want to. All will be held responsible for God to obey the demands of the gospel. Justice will then prevail in all of these areas by his grace when these demands are met. And the question is, have you secured your rights in the gospel? Or are you still in disobedience to the will of heaven? Uh, we will talk about later, at a later date, uh, the liberty that we have in Christ. But the only way to access liberty in Christ is to be obedient to his will, either to be uh, baptized in accordance with uh, the demands of Scripture or to repent of those things that have separated you from Christ. Whatever the spiritual need may be, we'd like to take this opportunity now to stand and sing. <laughs>